I'm looking at this, however, from the point of view, from the point of view of a family, a Palestinian family sitting today in Khan Yunus, in the rain, in the chill of uh, of February, you know, uh, having Khan Yunus be destroyed, and now Israel moving into the Rafah area. Uh, you know, uh, you know where you have uh, you know a couple million displaced Palestinians, and that family is saying, "What is going to happen to me today? This is urgent." That's why the ceasefire was so important. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Today's webinar takes up uh, some of the takeaways from the recent International Court of Justice's ruling that, quote, South Africa made a plausible case that Israel's committing genocide in Gaza. The title of our webinar, The International Court of Justice Genocide Ruling, Meaningful, Symbolic, Missed Opportunity, or Shining Moment, demonstrates some of the varied interpretation of the ICJ's ruling has received worldwide among Palestinians, as well as Israelis and those non other non-Palestinians who stand in solidarity with Palestine. We'll be covering what the ICJ ruling means for a ceasefire agreement. Will the genocide end? Will it make the genocide end? What does it mean for the people on the ground in Gaza today, as Israel's amassing its troops outside Rafa ready to Further, further ethnically cleanse hundreds of thousands into Egypt and other places. Does the ruling have any teeth? Will Israel comply? What are the implications of the ruling for international law and court cases here in the United States and around the world? What does it mean for the U.S. and other supporters of Israel's genocide going forward? All these and more will be part of the conversation today with our two esteemed guests. We're happy to welcome two prominent Jewish voices uh, into the conversation and Jewish voices that are uh, a part of the uh, Palestinian uh, uh, justice and solidarity movement. Robert Herbst, my co-chair at ICAD USA, a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, Westchester County, and human rights attorney who's been an investigator and prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunals of Sierra Leone in Rwanda. Also, we welcome Dr. Jeff Halper, founder and executive director of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, co-leader of the One Democratic State Com Campaign, a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, and author, most recently, of Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine, Zionism, Settler Colonialism, and the Case for One Democratic State. Bob and Jeff, welcome. I thought we'd begin uh, by giving both Bob and Jeff about 10 to 15 minutes to, to share their view of the ruling, and then we'll have a conversation. Bob, why don't you begin? <clears throat> thanks, Mike. Uh, uh, and thanks to uh, everyone joining us uh, for your time. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with Jeff Halper and uh, Mike Spath. Uh, there are a few people in the world I admire more than Jeff and Mike, and it's great to be here with you, with you both. Uh, Jeff and I have some have have some different views of the decision, and and we're going to talk about them. But very uh, briefly, I want to make sure everybody understood understands what the court did first. The Inter International Court of Justice determined that Israel was plausibly committing genocide in violation of the Genocide Convention which prohibits acts intended to bring about the destruction of a substantial part of a national, racial, and ethnic group like the Palestinians by, among other things, mass killing and inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about their physical destruction. And because the court found that Palestinians faced a real, imminent, and urgent uh, risk of genocide before the court could complete its, its proceedings, the court granted what we would call here in the, in the United States uh, legal system a preliminary injunction, an order of preliminary relief, which at the ICJ uh, are called provisional measures. And the court ordered six of them. 
Take all measures to ensure that acts deemed genocidal under the Genocide Convention do not take place in Gaza. Ensure that its military doesn't commit genocidal acts. Prevent and punish incitement to genocide. These are also all orders on Israel. <laughs> Enable and facilitate the provision of basic services and humanitarian assistance to the people of Gaza. Prevent destruction of and preserve evidence of genocide in its military operations and report to the court on its compliance within a month. The court also found that Palestinians were a national group protected under the convention. Israel has always opposed that contention and will give international lawyers more ammunition to challenge Israeli apartheid under international laws, making apartheid a crime against humanity. And all states are now on notice that they have a legal obligation to prevent the Israelis from committing or continuing to commit this genocide. My position is we should all be utterly in awe of what South Africa was able to achieve in this case. It put Israel in the international criminal dock for the first time. South Africa's 84-page complaint was an utterly extraordinarily, extraordinary and master fully compilation of the evidence proving Israel's genocidal intent and genocidal acts in violation of the convention. They forced Israel to attempt to defend itself in court for the first time on the gravest charge of international criminality there is, genocide. In violation of a convention was established in large part because of the genocide against the Jews. And against substantial odds, South Africa won provisional measures. And because those measures were specifically designed to make sure the genocidal acts did not continue, to preserve evidence of the genocide, to prevent and punish the genocidal incitement statements of its public and military officials, and to let medical and humanitarian aid into Gaza, the decision, in my view, was a total victory. I'm also in awe of what the court was willing to do. It didn't punt. It didn't concede to political pressure from Israel or the United States or the UK or Germany, the powers that be in the United Nations. It did the right thing on the merits of the case. It granted provisional measures that if implemented would effectively curtail, if not end, Israel's massive military operations against the Gaza civilian population. And remember in Bosnia, the court's action came three years after the killing ended. Here, the court was intervening in an ongoing genocide and telling the state responsible for it to end it. And the court did this virtually unanimously, 15 to one, with an American judge presiding and reading out the decision that, uh, that she supported. And requiring Israel to report, to report back in a month on what was done to comply with the provisional measures the court served notice on Israel that if they don't treat these measures seriously, the court will treat noncompliance as further evidence of, of, of Israel's genocidal acts and intent when the court gets past this preliminary stage of the proceedings to the merits. So the court spoke truth to power on behalf of the rule of law. And in the annals of international law and the international courts, this decision was so extraordinary my old international law teacher and Palestinian rights advocate, Richard Falk, called it the greatest moment in the history of the court. I agree. I think it was huge, huge, huge. Now, some have expressed a different view. Uh, while applauding the court's determination of plausible genocide and the court's imposition of provisional measures, these critics of the court's decision have characterized the provisional measures as weak and as non-operative and ineffective to help Gaza victims now. Because in tandem with the provisional measures, the court should have, should have ordered a general ceasefire. Without a ceasefire, they have argued, the provisional measures will have no impact on actual military operations and will permit Israel to argue self-defense when it violates the provisional measures. Accordingly, the real subtext or message of the ICG ruling, and Jeff, I think you wrote this, was we give you Israel permission to continue your military campaign in Gaza with genocidal consequences. I want to suggest that that criticism is misplaced and misguided, both as a matter of legal interpretation of the decision and as a matter of strategy 
for those of us uh, working uh, in, this, in this field. So let's take the legal interpretation first. The court, in my view, could not impose a general ceasefire, a secession of all military operations. And I think the one tactical mistake that South Africa made in its presentation was to ask for one, because it is beyond the court's jurisdictional, jurisdictional power in this case, which, which was brought solely under the Genocide Convention to enforce the Genocide Convention to prevent only genocidal military operations, not all military operations. So for example, if Israel sent special forces into the tunnels to engage and kill Hamas leaders or fighters, that would not be the kind of genocidal military operation that could be prohibited in provisional measures. So asking for a general ceasefire, I think, was like asking a stone to give blood, something that the court couldn't give and at the same time maintain its legitimacy and credibility, which it has, by the way, uh, across the world. Secondly, I think the court carefully constructed its provisional measures to do effectively the same thing or at least the next best thing, and to do almost as much good as a ceasefire. The court effectively ordered Israel to end its genocidal acts in Gaza and to immediately enable basic services and humanitarian assistance to flow into Gaza. I think it is clear that implementation of those two measures alone would effectively mean drastic curtailment of Israel military operations including a complete end to the indiscriminate bombing, the mass killing and wounding of civilians, and the wholesale destruction of homes, building infrastructure, and hospitals. Because there's no way, just way, and no way really to provide the huge amount of services and aid needed and to protect the doctors and nurses and other medical providers and aid workers providing it without ending or curtailing military operations against civilians. So I believe that it's wrong to suggest that without a ceasefire, the provisional measures would have no impact on actual military operations, or that the only way the court could have acted effectively to help the Gazans now was to add a general ceasefire, or, ceasefire order to the provisional measures. They do alone most of the work of a ceasefire if Israel were to comply with them as ordered by the court. I would also add that the provisional measures would also require an end to Israel's displacement of 2 million Palestinians and its effort to ethnically cleanse Gaza of its Palestinian inhabitants by shipping into Egypt. So the court's um, effective ordering of the drastic curtailment of military operations and the end to displacement and ethnic cleansing is a very big deal in my view. And of course, under international law, self-defense is not a defense to genocide. So Israeli's prime, that was Israel's primary defense in the court. And, and it, it really, that argument is meritless under the convention. So for all these reasons, uh, Jeff, I would argue that the real message of the ICG ruling was not giving Israel permission to continue its genocidal military campaign in Gaza, but just the opposite. And had the court intended <clears throat> to endorse or countenance Israel's genocidal operations, it would have made no sense to order it to report in one month on its progress in implementing the provisional measures. Now, moving for a minute or two from legal interpretation to strategy. <clears throat> what the critics of the court have said in terms of focusing on the ceasefire is exactly what every defender of Israeli genocide has said in denigrating and making naught of the court's decision. I saw an example of this just last week. The New York State Trial Lawyers Academy had a program attended by more than a thousand lawyers whose subject was how to use the law to combat anti-Semitism. And so I looked in to see, see uh, what, uh, what what they were saying. And one of the speakers was asked about the court's decision and the accusation of genocide, and he explained it away in precisely the same terms. Oh, the court didn't order a ceasefire, so it rejected South Africa's ridiculous allegations of genocide. Its decision was therefore effectively meaningless. And don't even, don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. 
So I think such criticism fuels the propaganda war that Israel and its apologists are making on the court and its actions. Um, and uh, and I think it's I think it's counterproductive. I, I think that um, what we need to do <laughs> is precisely the opposite. We need instead of criticizing the court and the decision, we need to focus our criticism like a laser on the perpetrator of the genocide. And if it continues not to comply on the non-compliant geno genocider. Um, I think, I don't know if uh, Mike, if I've used 15 minutes, but I think, I, I think maybe I'll, I'll stop now and, uh, and let Jeff uh, uh, have his chance. Thanks, Bob, very much for uh, uh, sharing your position. And uh, Jeff, take it away. All right, thanks. And uh, thanks to Bob, actually, for initiating this, uh, this discussion. That I think is important because it is a discussion that's going on, I think, between more legally minded people and activists uh, and among Palestinians as well. I think there's a real uh, divide in, a, in an opinion about this. I mean, I don't disagree with Bob in any way. I think international law is wonderful. I mean, there's a corpus beyond the genocide convention. There's a corpus of law that's really thought through and thorough and it's it's a wonderful body of law you know it's a human right to live in sanitary aesthetic uh, situations you know you have a human right not to live in a slum i mean it's really been thought through women's rights and children's rights and and you know so the body of law is is wonderful nobody can really argue with it it might, uh, in many ways, um, I mean, you can argue with it in a way. Some, sometimes it does reflect the interests and the views of the powerful, and especially the West. Uh, for example, in the laws uh, about terrorism and in the Genocide Convention, and this is where I'm critical of it, it's all based on intent. You have to prove an intent to genocide. Why? All that does is it protects the states. So a state can do, you know, I mean, in other words, if 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 Israel's committing genocide, which it is, in my view, and in the view of the law of the the I, the ICJ says plausible genocide because it hasn't ruled yet on genocide. Um, if there's no intent, if, in other words, all the Israeli leaders had shut up so they couldn't have quoted all these guys that opened their mouths. And if they had hidden all kinds of documents and there was no provable intent, I mean, the whole thing would have kind of fallen flat. So this whole issue of intent comes to protect states. And that's where it's all kind of skewered in the way uh, that protects states. You know, uh, non-state actors that are called terrorists, we don't call states terrorists. In other words, state terrorism is not really recognized in international law. But non-state actors many of whom, like Palestinians, are resisting and fighting for their for their liberation, don't have those don't have those protections. In other words, uh, in other words, there's nothing to do with uh, uh, with intent when you're dealing with terrorists. That's judged by terrorism is judged by the acts. And the acts again are decided by states. And so terrorists are usually uh, considered a, a non-legal, um, in other words, states do not obviously um, condone or legitimize non-state resistance to their own oppression. But, but at the same time, uh, intent has nothing to do. In other words, if, if, if Hamas, who is considered a terrorist movement in, 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 in the international community, um, would make its case that it's actually a resistance movement against, uh, against oppression, that really doesn't it doesn't cover Hamas in any way because they're judged on the acts that they do, whereas states are judged by intent. So international law isn't exactly, a, you know, a, a, a system that's applied equally to states and non-state actors. But beyond that, I think the difference between me and Bob, it's it, it's just in expectations maybe and in emphasis. 
Bob is coming from the world of international law. And uh, and in that world, this is a huge victory. Richard Falk, uh, who's a friend of mine as well, you know, said that. And not only that, but Richard also talks about what he calls the war, uh, uh, the war of legitimacy. In other words, he's Richard is saying that international law or the rulings of the ICJ on this case give us the activists tremendous legitimacy. I mean, Israel, you know, can't just uh, um, you know dismiss the idea of, of, of genocide. It gives legitimacy to our political positions, and at the same time, it calls into into question the legitimacy of Israel. And certainly the legitimacy of what it's doing. And Richard says, you know, the, the downfall of South Africa, you know, came about when it lost its international legitimacy. In other words, he's saying, Richard, that, you know, a state can win every military battle and be militarily powerful and politically powerful. But once it loses its legitimacy, that's when uh, the downward spiral begins. And that's certainly something that the ICJ, I think, has given us a, a, as activists. So from that point of view, everything is everything is good. And I agree with Bob that it is a tremendously useful tool and we have to certainly employ it as political activists. I'm looking at this, however, from the point of view, <laughs> not only as an activist, but let me say as a from the point of view of a family, a Palestinian family sitting today in Khan Yunus, in the rain, in the chill of, uh, of February, you know, uh, having Khan Yunus be destroyed and now Israel moving into the Rafah area, uh, you know, uh, you know, where you have, uh, you know, a couple million displaced Palestinians. And that family is saying, what is going to happen to me today? This is urgent. That's why the ceasefire was so important. I don't care to tell you the truth what the legal problems were, that it was hard to differentiate between actual genocidal actions and legitimate, whatever they are, military uh, uh, activities or operations. I don't know what legitimate means. One thing that doesn't come into the ICJ discussion for some reason is that Gaza is an occupied territory. That somehow has, I mean, it's like layers on layers. It isn't only genocide, but this whole idea that Israel can even claim self-defense in, 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 in attacking a non-state actor in an occupied area that it's controlling illegally. Why illegally? Because occupation is defined as a temporary military situation. And now after, after uh, 56, 57 years of occupation, it's no longer a temporary military situation. The Israeli occupation itself is illegal. So that, so that the whole idea that the International Court of Justice has the authority, it has the authority to issue a ceasefire. And I think the reason South Africa asks for that is because this is the urgency. Who cares if after three years, the ICJ rules that Israel's committing genocide? I mean, that's going to be a great, a great victory for the war on legitimacy after three years. In three years, these people are going to be three years gone. The, you, know, the, you know, the people of Gaza, you know, partly dead, maybe partly completely displaced, but certainly homeless. In other words, there's an urgency here. And that's, I think, what got people like me and other activists very upset that the court did not respond to the urgency of the moment. And I disagree with Bob very respectfully. And I don't think, and this is what a lot of, even al Haq, the Palestinian uh, uh, human rights organization, are arguing that I just don't see at all. The, this whole idea that, well, all right, it's not a ceasefire, but these six provisional measures add up to a ceasefire. In other words, Israel can't, take measures, um, you know, it has to it has to take measures to ensure that acts deemed genocidal in the Jim Convention do not take place in Gaza. You know, or that ensure that this military does not commit genocidal acts. I mean, those are very general. What in the hell does take all measures mean? That's why I say it's not an operational 
provisional measure. There's nothing, I, what does it mean take all measures? And, you know, I think we should have had this discussion. I actually mentioned it to Bob before, after the report is, 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 is put in, because so far, as far as I can see, the ICJ ruling of almost a month ago has had no impact whatsoever on Israeli military operations. Israel's continued to destroy Khan Yunus. The day the ICJ ruling was was uh, was uh, was given, Israel invaded the main uh, refugee camp in Khan Yunus. Now Israel is going into, and it will go into Rafah, where there's almost two million refugees from the north, and now it's going to forcibly transfer, which is itself a genocidal act. It's continuing its genocide. And I don't know what this report's gonna gonna come up with. We'll see. It's supposed to come out in another week or so. How is it now? If the court really takes this report and says this report is not good enough, Israel has not taken the measures to prevent genocide. Now we're going to order a ceasefire. Then I'm on Bob's side. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And there, in other words, there is no effective redress. For the Palestinian family sitting today in Khan Yunus from the International Court of Justice or from the whole world of international law to protect that family and to address the urgency of their need to end the Israeli attacks this minute to have a ceasefire. And that's where I think international law fails. International law is wonderful, but as we know, and I'll finish on this point, as we know, its enforcement mechanism is completely weak and 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 is controlled by states. In other words, even if the ICJ does decide to sanction Israel in some way, that's going to have to go to the Security Council, which which ironically or not ironically is the enforcement mechanism of the UN. Well, here you have the United States with a veto power. Not to mention other pro-Israel actors like Britain and France, uh, you know, so that there's no chance at all, even if the ICJ does do what it does and issue a, a ceasefire uh, a, a order, that it's going to pass through the Security Council. And so international law politically becomes symbolic. And here again, I agree with Bob and I agree with Richard Falk that symbolism is great. It's very important. I'm not saying that in a cynical way. It gives us instruments for political action. But international law by itself is not going to, 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 to help us in any way. We have to take the ICJ decision and then, as Bob was saying uh, towards the end of his remarks, translate that into political action. It, it gives us tools, it gives us concepts, it gives us legitimacy, the, uh, the international law, the ICJ ruling, but we have to translate that into some political program that in fact ends the occupation, ends Israeli colonialism, ends genocide, ends apartheid, and comes up with some kind of, of, of a just resolution. All of that is beyond international law. So I guess what I'm saying is it might have been a huge victory for international law, it wasn't such a huge victory for the family sitting in Khan Yunus in the rain. And that, as an activist, was my concern. Okay. I, I, if I can, uh, Mike. I, Bob, Mike let me get in, Bob, let me get in here uh, and uh, just identify, and then I'll let you and Jeff have this conversation. Sounds like, I mean, at least there are four areas that the two of you are kind of uh, 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 in conversation about and maybe have some disagreement is this and you both have addressed it but I, but let's pinpoint them then is this a de facto ceasefire or is it is it just symbolic number two what about the implementation and enforcement is there any teeth to this uh ruling by the icj jeff made a point in what he wrote that defining genocide as acts limits limits uh, the understanding of gen genocide because because uh, uh, Israel can say that it's uh, 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 it's just self-defense. And then number four, what about uh, political action in light of this ruling? So Bob, take it away. Okay, Jeff, I think 
you have been given a, we have all been given a gift horse and you can't see it and you're looking at it, you know, the mouth. It's as if two pieces of gold were presented before you, one labeled a provisional measure that accomplishes a ceasefire in effect, and one that's labeled ceasefire. And because, uh, and, and, and one labeled no ceasefire, you know, but the fact that that the court didn't didn't uh, give you a ceasefire is sort of blinding you and and others to the fact that the provisional measures granted did amount to what Mike uh, called a de facto ceasefire. And the problem that I have is that every time you or someone else says the decision and the court were defective in the relief that they granted, it gives Israel an excuse to say that that the process is defective, the ruling was defective, and doesn't mean anything. It's for naught. So if instead we concentrate on the fact that Israel cannot comply with the provisional measures without substantially curtailing its military operations to let this aid in and to stop the acts that the court is, is saying we're going to consider to be genocidal when we get to the merits. <clears throat> um, is, 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 it, 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 it's a real problem not to, not to recognize this because um, the, the criticism should be on Israel for not complying with it, for not complying with those measures. And if you interpret the measures as a de facto ceasefire, then you can shift your criticism to Israel rather than the court and rather, rather directed to international law. And by the way, genocidal um, intent, like any other intent, can be inferred from the acts themselves. So um, it's, it's hard to predict what the court would have done if there had been none of those genocidal intent statements. But they were there in profusion, and it made the case uh, basically airtight. So, and as I said, self-defense is not a defense to genocide. So that, that, that's, that's my, my, my fundamental problem with, with, with what you said. I mean, any law, the rule of law is, is basically a statement of principles by which uh, the, the, the people uh, or nations agree to live by. And if they're not, they can be declared. They can be declared by legislatures. They can be, be, be declared by courts. But ultimately, if if there's no commitment to them, um, you know, they 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 yield quickly to the to the rule of power and the rule of, of fear. Our job is to build up the uh, international law and decisions that are binding and considered by the world community as binding when like this one they come to us it's so rare that they come to us in the middle of a genocide and we can we can say okay the court has 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 decided this let's let's take it and run with it now i happen to think that there has been a significant impact um First of all, <clears throat> there was an announcement today that Netanyahu, the report in the paper today, so maybe it happened yesterday, that, that Israel now plans to evacuate, evacuate the civilian population north rather than south from Rafa. That's an indication to me of the, of the court's decision. Instead of ethnically cleansing the Palestinians, to Egypt, which was clearly their intention at the beginning. They're now going to move them within Gaza. Now, you know, it's a small point, but I think I think it's 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 just one of eight or ten indices of 
how this decision is being being taken seriously. It accounts for the fact that um, several nations, for example, have have voted to discontinue supplying weapons to Israel. Uh, last week, Spain halted all arms export licenses to Israel, urging all parties to abide by the court's directives. One of Belgium's three reg regions also halted uh, export licenses to Israel, citing the, the ruling. And a Japanese av aviation company and is ending its collaboration with uh, Elbit Systems, an Israeli weapons maker. So these are this is the beginning of the of of what you are actually calling for, you know, which is uh, a, a, a huge expansion of of uh, BDS. Um, but now there's a legal hook. You know, we have been complaining about settler colonialism and occupation for decades, and we have not, we've hardly made a dent. Now that what Israel is doing is labeled genocide, and three years ago was labeled apartheid, gives legal teeth to not just our organizing efforts, but the international community coming together and saying, we're not going to support genocide. We can't support it. Because if that, if that rule of law goes down the drain, we're done. Now, we are still in a global system where we lack global go governance, a global government. We don't have a, a, a global legislature. We don't have a global executive. All we have is the, the, the infancy of a, of a global judiciary with very weak enforcement. Again, that's, a, that's, not the, that's not the fault of the court and it's a decision, the court has to give its decisions within the, the rubric and the framework that we're left with. But, you know, I think one impact uh, among many of, uh, of the decision is the, the effect that it's had in the United States. I think you can attribute the uh, increasing criticism by Biden and the administration of Israel to the court's decision. Had the court's decision gone the other way, I don't think we would have seen this. And it is not clear to me at this point, when Israel fails to comply and, and they give their report in a month, it is quite possible to me that when that comes to that, that decision comes to the Security Council for enforcement, I'm not 100% sure that Biden will veto it. That to uh, me, the possibility that that exists is to me a sign that there is, uh, you know, that the that there's impact to the decision. And the the the, the State Department official who. Um, who resigned first from the from the State Department um, has said uh, that uh, let me see where it is here. Yeah, that dissent within the administration has increased after the decision. Josh Paul. <clears throat> he said that uh, while the Biden administration is dis dismissing the decision in its public statements, behind the scenes, the impact is already being felt. No one goes to work for the U.S. government in order to be complicit in a genocide, he said. And he hears from his former colleagues that American officials are recusing themselves from the decision-making process on arms transfers to Israel for fear of risking arrest under an ICC, that's the International Criminal Court, warrant on some future European vacation. So now, Bob, let's let's let Jeff get in here, and uh, I mean, wrap, yeah, wrap let me just, let me just let me just sum up. <clears throat> that means that two things. Number one, the provisional measures, if properly interpreted and not criticized, could have an immediate impact on the Gazans. And two, the, the general impact is going to reverberate if it's respected and we try to enforce it. Thanks, Thank Bob. Jeff? And Jeff, you're muted, right? Thank you. Well, 
All right. I, 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 we should leave time for questions and discussion. So I, I'm going just... to bring some questions in as soon as you're, uh, as soon as you wrap up, Jeff. But I guess the time. big thing that Bob and I disagree on uh, is uh, because, again, I don't want to minimize the fact that this is very useful for us, this decision and international, you know, and all of that. I'm just I just disagree with Bob that this that those provisional measures, first of all, they do not respond to the urgency of the moment. They do not give relief to the family sitting in Khan Yunus who needs today a ceasefire. And they had the power to authorize a ceasefire. That's what I guess, uh, you know, upsets me. They had that power. I mean, wh why they decided not to, there could be excellent legal reasons, but they had the power to do that. And that would have addressed the urgency. Beyond that, what I don't agree with with Bob is that those, those provisional measures uh, amount to de facto ceasefire. That is simply not true in any way. They haven't, as far as I can see, following the war fairly closely from here, they haven't affected the Israeli military operations at all in any way. On the contrary, this thing with Rafah is not really true. I mean, what, what Bob is saying, you know, uh, Netanyahu is saying, <laughs> how's this for a decision? They're not going to go south. They can't go south because Egypt will open. Will Egypt has said we'll kill thousands of Palestinians if they try to go through the border into Egypt. South is not an option. So Netanyahu is saying to the two million people sitting in Rafah, you got to move. Now, if you can press Hamas to agree to a hostage deal, we'll let you move north into Khan Yunus. I mean, there is no more Khan Yunus. So I don't know where they're going to be moving to. That's, that's the good option. And if there is no deal, then uh, <laughs> we'll, maybe we'll move you to the coast. We don't know where we're going to move you. They, they have no place to move them. And what I'm saying is they're going to do Rafah anyway. And, and, they, and, they have, and they want to do it before Ramadan, which is in three weeks. So you're going to move two million people in three weeks to some safe place and then, and then destroy the rest of Gaza? I mean, this is a de facto ceasefire. I mean, I just don't see it in any way. And again, the provisions are so general that, you know, take all measures, ensure this. Uh, and, and those are the are the only two things. The other four, you know, you know, Israel should should punish incitement to genocide. Who cares? You know, enable the provision of, of basic services and humanitarian aid. That's not happening. There's less humanitarian aid today than there was when the ACJ, when the ICJ made its ruling. Prevent destruction of evidence of genocide. Uh, big deal. I mean, someday that maybe that'll be important. Report to the court within a month. I mean, all those are so weak. They, 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 they don't even approach anything near a de facto. I have this whole ceasefire, this whole, this whole discussion about, you know, this is. The ceasefire, a real A and ceasefire B. I don't think that's true at all. There is no ceasefire B, and that's, I guess, the big the big disagreement. Uh, uh, just one more little tiny point, and that is, you know, we're talking about all these years. Bob mentioned of we're fighting occupation, we're fighting this. This isn't the first uh, international law Israel's violated. The Fourth Geneva Convention uh, that was uh, that was adopted by the UN in 1948 to protect people living under occupation and to and to constrain uh, occupying forces from harming a civilian population. Israel has violated every single article of Fort Geneva Convention for the last for the last uh, for the last 56 years. You're not allowed to demolish homes. Israel's demolished 60,000 Palestinian homes in the occupied territories in 67. You're not allowed to move your civilian population into an occupied area. You're not allowed to harm the economy. You're not allowed to have an economic closure. You're not allowed to uh, to build highways. The highway system Israel's built to incorporate the West Bank into Israel. You're not allowed to annex territory like Israel did with East Jerusalem. It's in violation 100% of the fortune of the convention, which is no less important than the, than the, than the genocide convention. Where's, where are the courts? Where's the enforcement? Nobody's even heard of the fortune of the convention. And that's what a, that's what actually would dismantle if that was implemented. 
alone, that would dismantle Israel's occupation completely. And so, you know, that's why I'm saying after all these years of being an activist, you know, and knowing that these instruments exist and knowing that they that they apply directly. I mean, I spoke to I don't know how many parliaments about the 14th of the convention and all of this. And there is no action. There is no effective enforcement. So I really don't care what's going to happen in a few years. I care about what's happening today. And from my point of view, again, I, I guess it's expectations. I am disappointed in the decision of the of the ICJ. Let me uh, thank you, Jeff and Bob. I'm going to I'm going to uh, ask a, a couple of the questions from uh, some of our uh, viewers, and they all seem to come around uh, the UN and uh, uh, it, its uh, work at the General Assembly. Why? So, from our friend Don Wagner, why can't South Africa demand a ceasefire now and get other signatories um, to the ICJ? to take that position or, or to go to the General Assembly now? That's one. From our friend John Kleinhexel in Michigan, what chance do we have of urging Biden not to veto any Security Council resolution? And there's another one about the UN. Um, how are these decisions more powerful than the countless UN resolutions that have condemned various actions by Israel dating back decades. So those three all having to do in general with uh, the UN. And so, um, uh, Bob, you want to you want to address that or anything else? And then we'll come back to Jeff. But I just want to remind you, we've got about 20 minutes, 25 more minutes. And so we don't want to we, we want to be a little bit more concise with our replies. Well, I think <laughs> I, I think my my point is that instead of criticizing the court, some of these other actions taking advantage of the decision and the fact that the court has effectively labeled what Israel is doing genocide, a plausible genocide, to then then uh, bring uh, bring an action, uh, bring it to the uh, Security Council. Now, um, you know, that's something that Algeria uh, indicated it was going to do, and I haven't seen that presented in, in the Security Council. But, um, but it's certainly a, uh, an option, and it is also a, an option after um, the second phase of these preliminary proceedings when Israel uh, makes its report and the court decides whether there's compliance. But I think, frankly, the point that Jeff is missing is that the court did not have the power to order a genocide. I mean, to order a uh, cessation, a complete cessation of hostilities. Number one, they had no power over Hamas to order Hamas to do it. And they had no no uh, uh, power to order Israel to stop, for example, going into the tunnels to, uh, to flesh out Hamas fighters. But they did the next best thing. And every time, Jeff, you attack them, for doing it and say it's meaningless, it becomes more meaningless. So I would urge you to stop doing it, which is why, which is why I, I, I enticed you into having this conversation. Stop it. Well, you know, we, we, we ought to just remind everybody that both Bob and Jeff have devoted their lives to supporting the liberation of Palestine and Palestinian human rights and justice for Palestinians. So I just want to remind our viewers, right, that both of these men have given their lives to this work. Jeff, you want to reply? Well, I also love Jeff, too. So. <laughs> Jeff, do you want to uh, reply not only to Bob, but these questions about the UN and the resolutions and then the General Assembly? I was hoping that Bob would reply to those because actually he's, <laughs> more, they're more legal questions. I'm not a legal... I'm at the end, an anthropologist. <laughs> so I think Bob should really respond to Don's question and John Don, John's question and so on. Um, I, thought, I thought I did respond to Don's question. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Well, what didn't, what's left there, Mike? Well, Jeff, go ahead and then we'll come back. All right. I, 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 look, my, one of my, I tell you, that, uh, let me, let me back up a little bit as an activist. Uh, I'm certainly not, I'm not attacking the ICJ. 
I'm certainly not attacking. I mean, I, I, like I keep saying, I, I agree with you, Bob. I think this is this really is a gift for us. I mean, it's it's very. I mean, I agree that it's a huge victory in a sense. We can, but but we can't have. But but there's a gap between between the 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 the, the instruments we can use in the long term politically over years, and the immediate relief that Palestinians need today in Gaza. And that's my that was my concern. I have one other concern as an activist, and that is that, and it, and it addresses what you're saying as well. You know, you can't have too many expectations of human rights and international law. You know, I've noticed over the years, and I've been at this for a long time, that there's a new generation of Palestinians, young Palestinians, and I'm in touch with many of them, who are and and actually they're even writing about this in show in Al Shabaka and other and other sites that are say uh, that are beginning to say, look, we don't care about a political solution. We don't care if it's one state, two states, ten states. Just give us our rights. And this is what they're beginning to call the human rights approach. And my fear is that if Palestinians, young Palestinians in particular, abandon the political struggle and begin to put their trust and their eggs in the basket of human rights, and now just give us our rights. Well, who gives rights? Nobody gives you rights. You have rights, but nobody's gonna, going, going to actualize them except you through political struggle. And there's a real, so there's beginning to be a conflict, actually, between political struggle and this human rights approach. Because the human rights approach is very apolitical, and it's really saying, and they write about this. I can I can give you quotes. We don't care what the political solution is. Just give us well, give us our rights. What does that mean? What I mean, what kind of a state are we talking about? How are you going to, in other words, all the details that are so crucial for Palestinian liberation? I just get lost in this very vague human rights thing of giving us. And that's, I think, a fear that I have that if we give too much credibility, like I think Bob does, to this world of human rights and international law as an actual actual tool that we can use, I think we're beginning, we, 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 we begin to, uh, to withdraw from the political struggle. And, and in fact, the international law is a tool of political struggle. It doesn't go the other way around. International uh, yeah. is not going to liberate us. Human rights are not going to liberate us. It's only political struggle. And 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 that's, I think, uh, what my concern is in terms of this discussion. Okay, but I, what uh, I think uh, you're missing... Go ahead, what, what, no, no, what I was going to say, go missing, ahead and respond to him. Yeah, what I think you're missing is that what the court is giving us now is a powerful legal hook that can be used both in your political struggle and in the human rights struggle, and can be used to immediately or close to immediately help the Gazans. And that is, for the first time, a court has labeled what Israel is doing criminal. Criminal, it's genocide. And so now you are getting, for example, when the protesters come and they sit on, uh, on, on Biden's uh, speeches, and they sit on Lincoln's house, and now it's genocide Joe. It's Butcher Biden. And that's having an impact in the, in the United States, and I think it's having an impact on, on Biden's positions. It's having a position, uh, an impact on his rhetoric, and it may, if what they are saying is accurate, may be having an impact on what, what the United States is actually doing. Now, I will say that if it turns out that the flow of weapons <coughs> continues and the indiscriminate bombing using American weapons continues in the same scale, then and Biden does not uh, stop using his veto when when a resolution that's presented to the to the uh, Security Council says what Israel is doing is criminal, it's genocide. And we need to stop it. If he if he vetoes it, then then what I'm saying is 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 not the case. But uh, but there are some signs that that may be happening. And frankly, the only restraints on Israel's um, actions in the in now and in the future 
it seems to me, are the, the concern and liability that they will be labeled genociders, that they have, have been and that will continue, and they will be labeled criminals in the eyes of the world. The, the fact we have a legal hook now is something that you are not giving enough, in my humble opinion, not enough emphasis to. To me, it's enormous. And it and we need to we need to support it. We need to bring it up all the time. It's apartheid. It's genocide. It's not settler colonialism. It's not occupation. It's criminal activity. That's what has the world has to stop Israel from doing. If we can get that kind of discussion going, we can make some progress in, in much faster than we have in the past. I've read both of your positions and a number of other ones uh, uh, in preparation for today. And I had written out kind of a question, but uh, to see if I couldn't find at least a little bit of an overlap between your two positions. But I, I think one of our viewers said it is asking it better than me. And so I'm going to go to what Howard Horowitz uh, has written here. And I'm going to add, I'm going to just read what he's written. I do not think so. This is Howard writing. I do not think it's a matter of agreeing with Bob or Jeff. The ICJ decision is a great weapon going forward, as Bob is begging us to see and take advantage of. Jeff, on the other hand, is telling us that our work does not end or even begin with the decision. We need to save lives now and also act in the international political arena. Bob and then Jeff. I totally agree with my friend Howard. Uh, it's, it is, um, you know, we, we have to go forward and use it, but the, the only place that I would add or, or it's not really a disagreement. It's a matter of emphasis. I really think it's important for us to change our rhetoric as we go forward in the activism, um, you know, um, look, a court by itself can never uh, save lives, you know, directly and immediately save lives. But to the extent that we can use the court's decision to say in international forums like the UN Security Council, hey, this is criminal activity and, and it was unanimous, virtually unanimous from the court, we have to stop it. Um, it's genocide. That's an, that's an enormous tool that we didn't have before January 26th and that we have now. So I, I thank Howard for that point. Thanks, Bob. Jeff? Well, I'm not going to give up. Howard's my friend, too. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, I guess my point is that um, <clears throat> I, I were very focused, myself and ICAT as well, on on the political process on in other words i think you know where we get messed up and uh, you know there is no and this is what i've been saying for for a long time and and i can as a part of the one democratic state campaign which is a palestinian led it's very small just beginning but we have a 10 point program trying to advocate for one democratic state as a political way out in other words, we can't simply spend the rest of our lives trying to stop things, stop genocide. If you stop genocide tomorrow completely, that doesn't bring the refugees home. That doesn't liberate Palestinians. That doesn't deal with Israel and apartheid and so on as a political entity. In other words, these things, the use, the, 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 uh, uh, UN even if Biden agrees, Security Council sanctions, the courts, BDS, uh, all these things don't bring about a political solution. They're all tools. But my point that I tried to make before was that they're all tools that have to be at the service of a political program. And our fatal fault, our fatal flaw in the in the struggle for Palestinian rights, if I can say this is that we do not have a political program. We don't have an end game. 
And therefore, we're fighting rear guard actions. This ICJ thing is a rear guard action. BDS is a rear. They're all important, changing our language. The, the, the huge demonstrations you have in Washington. Uh, all of that is really important stuff. But to what end? And that's what's missing. If maybe I'm missing uh, the, the usefulness of the ICJ ruling in terms of, of some political struggle, I think what everybody else <laughs> seems to be missing is that there is no, there's a political struggle but without an end game. It's open-ended. And so we end up being reactive. We're reactive to things. And Israel and the United States and other actors, they're the ones that are proactive. You know, and, uh, you know, for example, right now, you know, Gaza is is appropriately, you know, the focus of our of our attention. But politically, Gaza is marginal. The real huge issue politically is the West Bank, where Israel is ethnically cleansing uh, Area C, the majority of the West Bank. And what people are missing is that Biden has already announced that he's going to impose a two state solution, which has to be apartheid on Palestine the minute the dust settles in Gaza. This is this is really the struggle. In other words, what we're talking about uh, uh, in ICAD with other organizations is launching a campaign against two-state apartheid. Because I can't believe the United States. It's impossible with Congress for the United States to agree to a two-state solution in which, in which the settlements are dismantled. 750,000 Israeli settlers go back to Israel. Uh, Israel gets out of the old city and annexation is canceled. Palestinians have a real state with territorial contiguity and control their borders. That's not going to happen. The only two-state solution possible in this political uh, climate is, is apartheid. And so, you know, we have... Uh, the problem is we get sucked in. I mean, these are, I mean, genocide in Gaza, there's nothing more important than that. But, you right. know, what Mike is telling me is that, is that, you know, when he talks to his Palestinian friends, they're saying to him, we're only focused on Gaza. Don't tell us about the West Bank. We don't want to get into two states, one state, political things. But that's our problem. That's our problem because we're missing the forest for the trees. And without minimizing at all the genocide that's happening in Gaza that we're, we've been engaged with for, for, for a long time as ICAD, that's a tree. It's a huge tree, but it's a tree. The forest is what's happening, the bigger process of Israel, uh, uh, you know, getting legitimized as an apartheid regime, the United States and Europe legitimizing Israeli apartheid in order that who cares about the Palestinians? The bigger fish is normalization. The normal they they're desperate, Biden and these guys, to get back to normalization because they want to fight China, they want to counter Russia, they you know, Saudi Arabia and the and the Gulf states want to become these global economic hubs. Those are the big issues. And so you've got to quietize. Uh, disappear the Palestinian issue, and that's what two-state apartheid does. So can the more I, we're, I, uh, just just as, as much as we're focused on international law and Gaza and everything else, we're missing the bigger picture. And that's what happens when you focus on human rights and you're reactive and you're focusing on things that are going on right now and the ICJ thing, which is very important, but it's not within the framework of a political program. But and Jeff, that, I think, the issue that we have to really address. All right, but so you've, you've changed the focus here of this discussion. <laughs> but, uh, and it's interesting that you say that we're missing the forest for the trees on this, um, uh, because the, that's actually what I, what I would say I thought you had done with respect to the ICJ decision. But, 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 but let me just, just take up one, one small part of what, of what you said. Very briefly, I believe Bob. that ultimately we need to have a political we need to have a political solution that incorporates human rights as well. <laughs> but for example, there's a legal hook there as well. You know, you're now using the word apartheid. Before those those apartheid uh, reports came out three years ago, which which gave a hook, a legal hook, 
to and a name and a crime to to uh, the situation in Israel Palestine because apartheid is a recognized an actionable crime against humanity. It was hardly used, and that has been, an, I think, an enormous tool in um, in 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 this work. Uh, as I think that the genocide crime is also going to be an enormous, an enormous uh, tool, but but not to recognize the strength and 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 the additional power that these legal uh, tools give us, these crimes give us, I think, is to miss the forest for the trees. Thanks. We I want to I want to have one more question. I'm gonna, and then we're going to wrap it up, but it's an important question and. Uh... Uh, the two of you can uh, address it. It's from our friend Linda Ramsden, who's the uh, the uh, chair of ICAD UK and a long, long time activist. So Linda writes, and I think many of us have this question, what happens at the end of the month that Israel's been given? Let me read her question. What will happen after the 23rd of February? How long will the court take to study Israel's report? What if the IJ, ICJ isn't happy with the report? What actions will be taken? Could this go on for weeks and months? Will there be anything left of the Gazan people? We know the place is being flattened. So this sense of urgency, but what happens after the 23rd of February? And might it even go to the General Assembly uh, at that point? Talk to us about that. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's a question for Bob. Okay, okay, Bob, take that down. All right. So and then we're going to wrap it up, Bob, after that. Okay. I first of all, it's a great question. And I don't think any any of us know the answers, the answer to this question. I think that um let me put it to you this way. If after after the report, if the court says <laughs> Okay, Israel, you have not complied, and now we're going to order an immediate ceasefire. Then you can forget everything that I've said, because that means or meant, <coughs> or will mean that that the court did have the power to issue a an immediate ceasefire. I don't think they're going to do that, because I don't think they had that power, because uh, I think all that we could have asked for the court and what they did was to order Israel to stop its genocidal acts. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be looking as, uh, you know, with wonder to see, see what, in fact, uh, they think they can do. Um, I think there may be things that they, can, that they can do more specifically within the genocide framing. Um, they can order the end to uh, perhaps the, uh, an end to the indiscriminate bombing, you know, things like that. But I think they're going to have, they would have, have difficulty in ordering uh, uh, both sides to, to seize fire, both because they can't prohibit Israeli acts that are non-genocidal. They focus on Hamas in the tunnels, for example, and they don't have jurisdiction over Hamas. How would so, they implement? How would let, they implement, let's see what they can do. How would they implement uh, a, a, a ceasing of the bombing? I mean, where's the, have to, where's that, the that order would go the to to the if it's not complied with, and they can set a time limit for that compliance. It's an interesting question why they why they set a month. I'll, I'll deal with that in, in a minute. But they could they could order an, an immediate cessation. Let's say of the indiscriminate bombing, right? That and if that's not complied with, then there's a resolution that comes to the Security Council. And if the United States doesn't veto it, the Security Council can enforce that um, that uh, rule. So you know we'll 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 see. Uh, by the way, I think the reason they gave him a month <clears throat> was that there's been a changeover now of four of the of the fifteen permanent judges on that court, including the American presiding judge. And so I think that the court was basically saying that, you know, we're, it, it's going to take us uh, a month to get, you know, to 
we're in, we have a new uh, bat, batting lineup, and um, you know, and so they so they made it a month so the new judges could be could be in place. I uh, I want to give Bob and Jeff the the last word, but before I do, I just want to remind you that this webinar was sponsored by ICAD USA and the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. The YouTube recording will be shared on the ICAD website in our regular ICAD USA newsletter, the report, and on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel. So uh, closing thoughts, uh, Jeff? <laughs> well, I think we've laid out kind of the, uh, the, the there are more disagreements, I think, of emphasis than of substance, because I don't think we really, we really disagree tremendously. And what Bob just said now is interesting, actually, because um, he sort of indicated that um, he didn't have to be uh, uh, an overall ceasefire order, he, you know, everything or nothing. They could have said instead of taking all measures, which was the first provisional uh, uh, measure, taking all measures to avoid, they could have broken that down and they could have said, Israel, you, you have to do one, two, three, four, five. You have to stop the indiscriminate bombing. You have to stop the destruction of Palestinian homes. You have to stop the forced transfer of the Palestinian population. Um, you have to, uh, 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 you know, whatever. In other words, actually take the acts that we're talking about that amount to genocide. And that would have given both a, um, uh, you know, that would have given an operational structure to that provisional measure. And then that would have given, you know, the court and the ability after a month to say, you know, these aren't just, you know, these are just cosmetic things that Israel's doing. They haven't really addressed one, two, three, four. So I think there was probably, uh, 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 you know, a better measure they could have taken than simply because it's true that Hamas is a non-state actor, uh, that, you know, Israel might have some legitimate self-defense concerns. Although, again, here's where the whole issue of occupation comes in. And do you really have self-defense against a, a, a territory that you're oppressing and which people are resisting? That becomes a whole issue of itself. So I'm not sure if that's true. But certainly, I think, to have issued uh, a more detailed operation <laughs> order that amounts to a ceasefire would have been much better than what Bob calls the de facto ceasefire of these very vague kind of provisional measures that, in my view, don't really add up to much. Thank uh, you, Jeff. So I, 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 just to, I just want to point out that the phrase de facto ceasefire is really Mike's <laughs> first. All right, so I, it appears that I have not succeeded in getting Jeff to shift his focus <laughs> um, from what the court should have done <laughs> to what it did and interpreting it in 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 the light uh, most favorable to us and said, okay, Israel, comply with it. You now have to stop your indiscriminate bombing. You have to stop destroying homes. You have to stop your ethnic cleansing because the court ordered you to do it. And that I think is but they didn't all order them view, to do that. In my view, the order, they didn't order them to do that. In, 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 they didn't in, order them to do that. They ordered in, them to my, take in, all measures. In, in my view, is the is the fundamental takeaway here that that's what needed needed to, to that's that's how we how we need to treat uh, to treat the decision. We need to support the court, um, not tear it down. Um, Look, there are clear limits to what law, and especially international law, can do because of the way we are so, so disorganized. And actually, I think that that um, the political program that we really need is one that establishes a, a global political organization so that we have recourse. The way, the way the federal government does when, when the governor of a state Commits uh, public, commits corruption, it can prosecute it. <clears throat> we really need a more effective global uh, governing system, but we don't have it, and so we're doing we're doing the best we can. Um, 
All right, I think that's it. Thanks. Mike, you're uh, muted. I think we can agree that uh, um, no matter what we think about the strength or weakness of uh, the court's decision, this provides us a tool, a powerful tool that needs to be implemented politically that it's now the ball is in our court as activists and as political actors on the on the global stage, as well as in our communities, as well as in the United States, as we stand as a as a as a, a, a United States government alongside Israel, we're as complicit and as criminal as uh, Israel is in aiding and abetting uh, the genocide of of the Palestinian people. So we need to take this tool now and implement it politically. And I want to say thank you, uh, Bob, and thank you, Jeff, for your insights today. The conversation continues. The ball is in our court. And I want to just say thanks to everybody on, on the uh, screen whose names, many of whom I know, some I don't, but I know Bob and Jeff, you know many of them. Uh, they've been longtime, longtime allies of uh, the Palestinian struggle and longtime allies of ICAD. So thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you again soon.